Today on VinWiki, as a Saturday special video, we've got our top 10 BMW stories. Obviously, there's a lot of amazing cars from BMW, but if you own a BMW or if you're shopping for a BMW, you need Carly. Carly is our sponsor for VinWiki videos this month, and it's an OBD device that makes your car even more connected than ever. It allows you to diagnose problems and get error codes from the OBD system. It also allows you to do coding to the car. If you go to a dealer and ask them to code in any customization to your car, they could charge you $50 or more per code. But Carly gives you a license to do that as much as you want on BMW models. It works for all cars, but it works particularly well on BMWs. It also allows you to check for mileage discrepancies as you shop and learn more about the cars that we love. And so if you've got a BMW or any car, please check out Carly at the link in the description below and use the code VINWIKI for a discount. But today, here are our top 10 BMW VINWIKI car stories. I naively took a personal check for a mountain like that. There's a point in every young, impressionable 17-year-old's mind where he finds himself perusing the web for exquisite examples of the most appreciated vehicles possible. At the time, I had been spending my summers and my uh, off days from school detailing cars and paint correcting and whatnot and applying, at the time, very primitive sealants and coatings and whatnot, so I had saved up some money. And I figured the best place you know, to, to look would be on the interwebs at the time and try and find what I would consider to be maximum budget of $15,000 M5, which today wouldn't buy you much, but back then, you know, a couple years ago, would buy you quite something nice, you know? I found an example, it was a Le Mans Blue over Carmel, extended leather interior, beautiful car, with just a tick under 62,000 miles, which was remarkable for its age. I immediately messaged the seller, and there was a few shoddy photos of the car, there's some pixels out in the cluster, which seemed a bit odd for a low mileage BMW, but also did not seem odd for a BMW of any age. We met up, and uh, the gentleman essentially told me that he was getting a divorce, and he needed the car gone. And his wife was either gonna take the car from him and do you know who knows what with it, or he needed the money for lawyer fees and whatnot. And I felt bad, but I also didn't feel bad enough to beat him up on the price a little bit. He was asking, I think, 16.5, which is a very fair price back then and very good deal today for a low mileage E39 M5. And I found myself saying, pushing towards maybe, hey, you know what? I offered him, I think, 12. And as Ed might say, I think we met right slack in the middle at 12.5. So I found myself driving home, you know, parents not in the picture on this one, with an E39 M5 new to me. I get a call from my mother who says, oh, can you stop at the local grocery store on the way home, pick up some eggs and milk and whatever. I said, of course, don't worry about it, oblige. I figured, you know, coming home with a new car, but with the groceries might be a little bit better for, you know, better uh, splash landing for me. So I remember I, uh, our local grocery store, Heinen's, has a front parallel parking lot. And I parked the car right in the front, front spot. And I, again, no license plates in the car yet. I hadn't even gone to the, the BMV yet in Ohio. And I walked into the store and came back and there was a gentleman rather, you know, pryingly looking at the vehicle and, you know, sort of cupping his hand, looking inside the vehicle. My first thought was maybe, you know, he was law enforcement looking at this car, got no license plates, is it stolen, whatever. And I figured that, you know, it's a Sunday afternoon. It's, you know, this guy seems like he might not be a law enforcement individual. And I figured, you know, hey, what's going on? And he said, this is a beautiful car. It's so nice. And I was like, oh, thank you so much. And he's like, you know, how did you come across it, whatever. And I was like a little apprehensive at first. And I, and I sort of asked him, I said, well, you know, I just bought it actually recently. He goes, oh, that's great, whatever. He goes, my, my father had a very similar specification M5, but in 2008, he unfortunately had to sell it. And I said, huh. And I had run a Carfax on this vehicle before, and I remember that it had traded hands 08, 09. I can't remember exactly when, but I thought, okay. I mean, but granted, a Le Mans Blue over Carmel and Ether 9 M5, it's, there's not a few of them, there's, there's not a ton of them, but it's like, you know, in the Northeast Ohio region, the car was stayed local for its entire life. We started talking more and whatnot. And he said, oh, well, you know, wh where'd you get it from? I said, well, I got it from a private sale. And he was sort of trying to pry, you know, price-wise and whatnot. And I was, you know, again, young, naive 17-year-old kid at the time, but I still wasn't trying to let him go with the entire 
with all the information, you know? He started saying, oh, well, I, you know, I'd love to buy one like this and give it back to him or whatever. He's retired now and he misses the car dearly, but the price of these cars have gone up. He took a bath in the car when he sold it. And I said, oh, you know, that's such a bummer or whatnot. So we get talking and, and, and you know, going over and I said, you know, you want to sit in the car, whatever, open the, you know, the coolant expansion tank was white, which is a rare thing for those E39 M5 owners out there that have been replaced. The car had been well, well cared for. It, it would eventually need probably some Vanos work as all early 2000s BMWs do need. But, uh, you know, we got talking and, and he essentially said, you know, well, I'd love to, I'd love to purchase this car from you. And I said, well, uh, you know, it's not for sale. I just purchased it, whatever. And I said, well, do you have your father's VIN number? Do you know which, you know, it, it, this might be, you know, joking, this might be the car, you know, trying to drive up the price a little bit for me if he was actually interested about in purchasing it, right? He goes, oh, well, you know, I, I, I don't know. Let me get the, let me get my old man on the phone, whatever. And so he sort of called up his father. And of course, the man had meticulous binder of service records and whatnot, which I failed to get with my, in my ownership. I got no records of the car. And turns out, lo and behold, it was the car, the same VIN number and everything. And I was smiling ear to ear at this point. And this guy was like, well, you know, I, I have to have it. And I said, well, that is the worst thing you could have told me to myself. And I was like, you have to have it? Great. The gentleman rather unshrewdly told me that he wanted the vehicle in the exact specification it was in. Perfect leather, perfect everything, paint the way it was as it left his father's garage. Well, I was thinking about repainting it. And he goes, oh, wrapping it or repainting? I was like, oh, I thought about maybe starting with Plastic Dip and moving on to repainting, you know, a few panels here and there. And I almost saw him wince. I thought, you know, the more I get under this guy's skin, the higher he'll go. So I said, well, I thought about lowering it too. And he said, oh, okay, maybe with some suspension, some 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 new springs. I said, well, I thought about just cutting the, cutting the original ones. And I think I saw his eyebrows meet his hairline, which was non-existent. And he rather said, oh, uh, <laughs> I was like, well, you know, I mean, every high school kid wants an M5, right? And he sort of, Again, once more, winced. And I said, well, I mean, everything's for sale for the right price. And that's when we started talking about price. And he said, well, throw out a number. And I said, well, again, you know, I mean, I just got the car. It's so great. I have all these things planned for it. I have all this money earmarked for it. It would have to be a good sum of money. Let it go. And he said, well, okay, come on. I mean, give me a number. And I said, well, I think 30 is a good number. And granted, these are not enthusiast auto group type of vehicles at this, at, to be asking $30,000 for an E39 M5. He wasn't quite in tune with the market and he said, oh, well, that's way too much for an 18 year old BMW, blah, blah, blah. And we started going on and on and on. We eventually settled right around 25. Being that it was a Sunday, the lovely individuals at the Ohio Bureau of Motor Vehicles were not in today. So I figured, why even title it? This nice gentleman wants to give me a check immediately. I figured, well, I can just remove myself from the whole situation and grab the closest thing for a bill of sale, which happened to be a cocktail napkin in the glove box, and write out a bill of sale to the nice gentleman purchasing the vehicle with the agreed on upon price, mileage and whatnot, and send him on his merry way. That's what we did. Luckily or unluckily for this nice gentleman purchasing the vehicle, I hadn't filled out my information on the back of the title yet. So my name, address, all that stuff was left off. So I figured, why even have myself be part of the situation? I can just be a two hour custodian of this nice vehicle and pass along with hundred miles added to it, to this nice gentleman in the Heinen's parking lot. And that's exactly what we did. I still had a bill of sale from the previous owner, which I quickly scrapped up, re rewrote that with the correct numbers on there and handed it to him. And then uh, I caught an Uber home and he was very happy and wanted to cut me a check. And, and you know, I naively took a personal check for a amount like that. But you know, I got his number and when I figured he would be good for it. seemed like a nice guy. And then I got home with an Uber and my mom said, you know, where are the groceries? I said, mom, I just made 13 grand in a day. The groceries are in the trunk of an M5 and it's gone. Don't worry about it. And his lease was up that week. Like this is like uh, divine intervention or something. So I, I followed pretty closely the, the giveaway that uh, Vinwicky, uh, the Vinwicky app did. Ed gave away his uh, 993 uh, Porsche, his 911. 
and uh, I followed that process and I thought it was really fascinating. It was very interesting how it was very different than what I keep seeing show up in my feed where buy this or sign your life away for that and we'll give you an entry. It seems like there's a lot of car giveaways so it's it's rather difficult to be unique and so the VinWiki giveaway was unique in that it didn't sell something, you gave it away to, to somebody that was an app user. Uh, and did a you know random drawing from from a grouping of people who who were very active using the app, and I just did one myself, and I really struggle with this because I have a natural affinity toward being a contrarian. You know, I tend to be a contrarian, as you can tell if you've watched any of the stories that I've I've told on this channel. And so being a contrarian means that I don't want to do the same crap that everybody else is doing. You know, a giveaway is generally intended to make a bunch of money. And I'd like to make a bunch of money too. But I also don't want to, I don't want to lose people. I don't want to come across as I'm doing it for a bunch of money. I really want to do it so that I can live this dream life that I'm living. Uh, and I want to keep the business going. And so at the end of 2018, I decided to buy a 1M. I chose the 1M. Uh, it's a car that I... You know, obviously Fall, it, was, it came out in 2011. It was a parts bin car that I was excited about when it came out. I wasn't in a position at that time to buy a car like that. And uh, it was something that I'd, I'd want to experience, but never wanted to own. I think it's a little small uh, for me. I'm not a, generally not a huge fan of turbo you know, cars that aren't naturally aspirated, uh, but it's certainly a car that I would want to own for a year or so. And so the reason I chose the 1M, I'm a huge BMW fan, and I owned an E92 M3 at the time. I didn't intend to keep it forever, but it was something that was a fun experience. I think it's something that YouTube allowed me to do. I don't know that I would have done it without the ability to make content and share it with others, but it's a car that, uh, you know, Valencia orange, way outside my comfort zone, but something that was really neat to experience and look at and build and drive, but not something I wanted to own for the rest of my life. I know that is a lifetime car, a unique car for many people. It was never mine, but it was something that I certainly enjoyed owning and would, would do it again. Now, I didn't buy it with the intention of doing a giveaway. My friend Adam LZ said, you should give that car away. And that's when my gears started turning. So I bought the car as a tax write-off that I intended to buy, enjoy, drive, modify, detail, get set up to what I call OG spec, and then sell it. And I knew I wouldn't make any money doing that, but I'd get to experience it. And so the intention was to have uh, that, that third or fourth car that I could turn over and experience and hopefully not lose a lot of money. Uh, and so when the idea of doing a giveaway came about, I thought, you know, maybe this would be a way that I could do all the modifications I want to do. I could build the car the way I wanted to build it. Uh, I wouldn't have to spare any expense doing so. Uh, and then I could feel good about um, giving the car away rather than, again, the, the goal isn't to make a bunch of money. But if I did it right, it could be a pretty viable business, business thing to do. And so another thing I thought about is, why don't I share the results? And so I wanted to be the first person that actually published the spreadsheet. How much money did I make? I decided that I would create you know, certain shirts and certain hats because you can't sell, if you're not familiar, you can't sell raffle tickets and have it open to the public. There has to be a way to send in a postcard and have a free entry. You have to limit it to certain areas of North America, like you can do Canada, but we can't do Quebec. So I hired an attorney and figured out how to do that. How do I go about doing this legally? Because this technically falls into the rules of lottery and gambling. And I'm not sure why Quebec doesn't allow it, but apparently they have a lot of weird rules. Sorry to you, to you French Canadians. We weren't allowed to give it away to somebody there. And so I started building the car. Uh, I bought every part that I've ever dreamt of. So if you're not familiar, IND Distribution, they're friends of mine outside Chicago, Illinois, and they curate uh, very similarly to the way I curate products for detailing in the garage. They curate products for BMWs. And so I've been shopping on their store for many, many years. I'd bought basically everything they made for the 1M and then some. Uh, and I put HREs on it and I put Brembo brakes on it and I put all, all bolt-ons. I didn't want to take drop the engine and, 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 and build it. If you're not familiar, that car is an N54 in it. But they've, you know, there's you know, roughly 700 of those, 750 or so in the US. At least there were at one point. Some of them have probably been crashed. But it's a real fun car. It was a great experience, but not something I wanted to own for a long, long time. So I built the car 
we ended up profiting about eighty thousand dollars i spent about a hundred thousand on it between buying the car putting all the parts on it getting alignments you know getting things fixed uh getting things tweaked changing out door cards and and fixing interior parts and things like that making a forty five thousand mile car look like it was brand new and the the magic of it was i got to tell the whole story and that's what i was so deathly afraid of that somebody would win it that didn't not that they didn't deserve it, but somebody would win it that didn't, wasn't a part of this whole thing, wasn't a part of the, the 1M story. And so the story was, I got to buy it, I shared that, I got to build it, I shared that. I also shared the process of doing a giveaway and what that was like legally, you know, how much it cost me to do that. Then I shared the, the results of how many people entered the giveaway and how much it cost me and how much I profited. And then at the end, I got to give it away Luck would have it, the guy, uh, it, and someone could have won it from Alaska or Hawaii or any, any state, they could have won it from Ontario, I'm in Florida, and the guy that won it was two hours away. I called him at 5 p.m. and I said, hey, did you know this is Matt Mormon? He thought I was calling to ask him about his pressure washer or something. He bought one of my expensive pressure washers. Also joined my membership program, uh, so we had a, a, quite a few entries. And I said, did you know you entered to win the 1M? Uh, and he said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, well, you're gonna have to come get it. And then, of course, he, you know, he, he went nuts. Uh, he drove up that evening. So I called him at 5 p.m. He was at my house by 8.30 p.m. And because I didn't have to pay to ship the car to Alaska, it occurred to me that maybe I should do a little shopping spree on my shelves. We filled the car up from top to bottom with every detailing supply. It was like six or $8,000 worth of detailing stuff. So I guess technically that cut into my profit margin a bit. So maybe I only made 72,000. Uh, my bookkeeper didn't like that. Luckily, the guy that won, he had a, an M235i and his lease was up that week. Like this is like uh, divine intervention or something. So the gentleman that won was a was a follower of what I do. Um, he was participated, bought things from my store outside of the giveaway, was a follower of the in my Inside the Hex membership program. And one of the things I said, it's probably why I haven't heard from him, I said, while building the car, I said, look, I don't want to become the winner's mechanic for this thing. It does have an N54. Those of you, and those of you that are N54 owners know that that can be somewhat uh, trying at times. And so I said very adamantly on many podcasts and every video I made that whoever wins this thing, um, lose my phone number <laughs> in a very, I guess it probably wasn't a nice way, but he was a gentleman in his sixties and uh, had means of his own, was a BMW fan. I was an introvert, much like many of us uh, that, that watch, watch what I produce. And, uh, and so I haven't heard from him. I think he still has the car. I'm sure if it was listed for sale, someone would have uh, sent it to me. So I think he's enjoying it and uh, maybe I should give him a call. But it was, it was a really unique, really great experience. And uh, like the, like the VinWiki giveaway, I had hoped to do it with my spin on it. And since then, I've actually done a garage giveaway. Ed Bullion's garage was my test garage. Another Obsessed Garage follower won. He's moving from Hawaii to Virginia, where I'm going to be doing a, a, a very similar garage makeover with flooring, lighting, cabinets. So it literally changed his life. Uh, and so it's really fun to be able to do that. I think we profited about 35000 on my small YouTube channel. I think that's, that's a pretty good number. Uh, where I was able to sell enough t-shirts and hats and things like that in order to in order to pay for the cost of the garage. The sticker on his garage will be about $75,000 worth of a car lift and everything you could possibly dream of in a garage, what we're doing for him. So the giveaway experience has been interesting, but just know, you know, if somebody's doing that, the goal was to make profit. And I don't think anybody should be faulted for that. It is a lot of work. What I didn't compensate myself for was the amount of hours that I took in building the car or or crafting or curating all the products for the garage gave away. But I tend to do quite a few of those a year. I think that that, especially after we do uh, and release the videos for the VinWiki garage and then do the, the videos for, um, for Emmanuel's garage that won, I think that uh, people are really gonna respond well to that. I think that's my niche. So car giveaways, I think are a dime a dozen. For me, I think it's gonna be a garage giveaway. It's difficult for me as a contrarian to jump in on the giveaway game, but I think that if done right, it can be, it can be done very differently and be appreciated by, by people that are watching. Your driver was struck by lightning in the parking lot.
I give this speech at a Rotary Club, and a guy comes up afterwards and says, a friend of mine's got a BMW he wants to sell. I said, well, okay. Would you help him determine the value? I said, sure. But I said, I'm not interested in a BMW. I don't need a sedan or a coupe. I'm, I'm all right. He says, okay. So I call a guy up, and I said, I understand you have a BMW you want to sell. He was in Virginia. And he says, yeah. I said, well, tell me what the model is. I'll give you an idea of what it's worth. I said, I'm not really interested in it. He says, it's an M1. I said, well, you just redefined this deal here. <laughs> I, I always liked the M1. And so we do a deal on the phone, and I violate every rule of buying a car. I fly to Virginia. I get there at 7 o'clock at night. It's pouring rain, and the car's had a color change. And we go to dinner, and the guy says, I don't have the title yet. It's coming in this week. And I had a cashier's check for the car. Well, he was wearing a rotary pin, and I was a Rotarian. I said, okay, I'm going to trust you with this. Here's the check. I'm going to take the car home. My friend Bob Snodgrass at Brumo said, that's the dumbest thing you've ever done in your life. I said, I trusted the guy. He was a Rotarian. So it was all right. I got the car. So my banker says, he spotted me the money until I could sell something else to pay for it. He says, what's this car you bought? I said, it's called a BMW M1. What's it look like? Uh, sports car. Uh, well, come on by when you get it. Let's go get a sandwich. So I pull up in front of the bank. I'm getting out of the car. It's white. Some guy says, is that a Ferrari? I said, no, it's a BMW. He says, I've never seen one like that. And I said, it's pretty rare. So he gets in the car and we drive to a sandwich shop. We're getting out. And some guy looks and says, is that a Lotus? I said, no, no, it's a BMW. Yeah, i never seen one like that. I said, it's, it's pretty rare. So I'm going home at night, and I stop at a traffic light on San Jose Boulevard, and this guy pulls up, runs his window down, and says, hey, man, is that a Pantera? I said, no, it's a BMW. He said, I've never seen one like that. I said, it's pretty rare. So I pick up my wife, and we decide to go get a hamburger at Hooters, which was near our house. We get the M1, we go up, pull up to the railing, and one of the little hoodettes was out there on the porch. She looks down and says, wow, an M1. <laughs> I said, you're the only one in town who knows what it is. She says, yeah, man, I got a poster of one hanging up on my wall at home. So I finally, the car was originally henna red, and the guy who owned it got tired of saying, no, it's not a Ferrari, so he painted it white. So I went back to henna red, and one day I pull in the Shell station, I'm fueling it up, and the guy says, how come this Ferrari has all these BMW medallions on it? I said, well, there's a good reason for it, because it's a BMW. Well, I've never seen one like that. It's pretty rare. So that was the pretty rare car. You know, they, they didn't have a lot of horsepower. It was like 277 horsepower uh, out of the factory. But it, it was like a really high-end kit car. There were panels that were pop riveted on it. They, they went to the parts box, you know, the 328, six series taillights, 328 instrument cluster. It wasn't a bad car. It just wasn't a great car. I had it about 10 years. And that's when I lost money on. Uh, if I'd have kept it another five years, uh, probably would have tripled my money. It just, it was in a dead spot at that time. I, I have this idea about value. It's a bell curve. It starts off, it goes up, it comes down. Mostly. There's some that go up and keep going. But most cars, when a guy is 20, he's down here. And he has his eye on a car. When he gets to 40, he's made a little money. He's put on a little weight. He wants to recapture his youth. So he's looking at that car he saw when he was 20, and so are other people. So the value goes up. And somewhere it crests. And when he gets to be about 70 or 80 years old, let's say he bought something here at 30, and now it's worth half a million, he's looking to cash in. So now a lot of them come on the market, and the value starts coming down. And I'm 76, so I'm over the top of that curve. And like my 57 Eldorado convertible, I love it. It's Bahama blue with a blue metallic leather interior. It is as big as the Queen Mary with the tail fins. And they were selling for about 250 five years ago. They're down around a buck and a quarter now because it's on the downhill side of that curve. The guy who, who remembers doesn't remember it. That's a car he doesn't relate to. The M1, it had little quirks. For example, the... Uh, the tray under the air conditioning condenser would plug with uh, bugs that would grow in it. And then you'd go around a right-hand corner and it would dump cold water on your, your accelerator foot. Or you'd go around a left-hand corner and it'd dump cold water on your passengers. And then if you didn't drive them a lot, it built up corrosion in the distributor caps. You'd have to take the cap off. Or if you needed to replace the cap, it was uh, Morelli. And they only did production run once every three years. 
So you'd have to buy two caps, keep one on the shelf. It would eat water pumps. And if you wanted to buy a water pump because the M1 wasn't built for the U.S. market, and you went to a U.S. supplier, you'd give them the part number, and they knew you had an M1, so a water pump that would cost normally 280 bucks on a 6 Series car is suddenly $1,500 because the shaft's a little shorter because it's mid-engine and they're trying to clear the firewall. So there were little idiosyncrasies about the car, and, and they, the ignition boxes, which were Morelli, which were similar to the Ferrari, they had a tendency to go bad. When they did, you had to send them back to Germany or Italy and get them rebuilt. So you had the distributor caps, you had the ignition boxes, you had the air conditioning unit, you had the kit car feeling of it. It, it handled good for a mid-engine car. It was very good, but uh, not a great car. Uh, I found out there's a uh, Worth makes a, an ignition oil that if you spray it on the inside of the cap, that problem went away. Air filters, if you bought them here in the United States, $300. If you found somebody in Germany who would get you one, 65 because the car wasn't made for the U.S. market. The only thing is, like I say, being mid-engine cab forward, your, your legs are kind of off to the right. It was a usable car. You know, you could drive it every day. You could throw luggage in it. You could take a trip in it. You know, that car had a kind of a checkered beginning. Uh, BMW designed a car. They decided they didn't have production facilities small enough to do it, so they contracted with Lamborghini to build a car. Lamborghini was going broke at that time. And they got no bad deals. And BMW had the bodies done in Italy and shipped to Bauer in Germany. And Bauer assembled the cars. So by the time it got to market, it was an older car. And they built it for Group 4 racing. You know, they had to build 400 of them to qualify for Group 4 racing. Well, they built 400. But by the time it qualified for Group 4 racing, Porsche was coming out with the 930, 934, and the game was over. So then they did the Pro Car Series where they took identical M1s and supported, it was a support race at the Formula One races. They would put Nicky Lauda, uh, Mario Andre, they put all these famous drivers in and do a support race at the Formula One because they didn't have any other place to race the car. It was not competitive. Uh, my friend Dave Cowart, who I've had a lot of fun with at Hershey, he had the Red Lobster M1 and uh, they won the GTO championship at IMSA with it, but it was because they were persistent. And uh, the year after they won it, of course, the game was over with Porsche. Let's see, the street car was 277 horsepower. The pro cars were pretty close to 400 horsepower. And then they did uh, a turbocharged version that ran uh, in Europe. Uh, I think they did one or two of those. And then uh, one of them, uh, Bruce Jenner, Caitlyn Jenner, whatever Jenner, uh, drove one at Daytona, Rusty Jones car, and they dropped a Chevy engine in it eventually. You know, the Chevrolet small block engine is probably one of the true automotive engineering masterpieces of all times. Oh, one other car I, I have, I, I forgot to mention, Jack Baldwin and I, uh, drove, uh, with Charlie McCarthy, uh, drove at the Watkins Glen 24 hour in a Chevy Camaro, a prototype 1LE, built by Bill Mitchell. And uh, I was able to buy that car back. I don't know what I'm gonna do with it. You know, it's, it, there's no place to race it, but it, it, it it was a, another story. Uh, I was racing with uh, Charlie McCarthy and his son, Charlie Jr. We were at Watkins Glen. Charlie Sr. starts in a car and it's pouring rain. I mean, it is just coming down like a Florida monsoon. And uh, young Charlie, just before the rain starts, I'm going out the car and get my jacket. So he leaves. And Charlie used to be an offshore boat racer, so instead of having the normal racing radios, we had the boat radios with a big fiberglass antenna in the pits. I'm wired to it. All of a sudden, there's like, oh, boom, a lightning strike. And I, said, I said to Charlie, I said, look, I'm not going to sit here wired to this radio. If you want to talk to me, flash the lights, I'll turn it on, but I'm, I'm getting away from this. And young Charlie didn't come back. Oh, about 15 minutes later, somebody stuck their head in the pits. Says, is this car 39? I said, yeah, why? He says, your driver was struck by lightning in the parking lot. He's in the hospital, and he lost his sight and had third-degree burns across his body. He recovered and became a Catholic priest. <laughs> I think he got a message. <laughs> so his dad's in the car. His mother is up on the scoring stand, and she grabs the chief mechanic and runs off to the hospital. 
So I called Charlie on the radio and I said, uh, you gotta come in, we gotta do a tire change. Why, everything's fine. No, 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 we mounted the wrong tires up. I didn't want to tell him what was going on. So he came in, get out of the car, said, you gotta go to the hospital. And, and so the other crewman takes him. So there's one crewman, my son, Clay, and I. And we're in the first 30 minutes of a 24 hour race. Well, the rules say I can do two back-to-back -back stints, which would be four hours. So the rain goes away and the sun's coming out. And I'm about two hours into this stint. And I'm saying, well, what am I, I gotta find someone else to drive with me. I mean, I, there's no one else in the pits. So I see Jack Baldwin who, from Atlanta, great driver, ran NASCAR, ran IROC series, Trans Am champ, good driver. His Camaro was offside the road, hood up. So I called my son on the radio. I said, find Jack Baldwin's pits and find out if he's out. And if he's out, will he come drive with me? And he, he went down and said, yeah, yeah, Jack, Jack will come drive. I said, okay. So we had started like 13th in the pouring rain and we dropped down in the 40s in, in the field because we had to stop early. And Jack came over and we hammered that car all night long. We didn't put a wheel wrong. He was always a second and a half faster than me, maybe two seconds. But we hammered, hammered, hammered. We didn't let anybody get in our way. And we wake up Sunday morning, we're fifth overall, you know, battling for fourth. We finished fifth. But uh, people ask me, what, what was your best race? I said, that one. I said, and that's not necessarily, I didn't win many races. I said, it's not races you, you win. It's where you felt you gave up all you could give. If you finish fifth, that, that's where you're going to finish. But I had a chance to buy that car back, you know, 15 grand. And it's perfect. It's, just, it's like it's brand new. You could eat off the underside of it. Had all the trick stuff, the aluminum drive shaft, the baffled gas tank, the radio delete, you know, all that stuff. And it sits in the warehouse. I take it out every now and then and drive it around. It's got straight exhaust, makes a lot of noise. But there's no other place to drive it, you know. Someday, there's enough of those Firehawk and uh, Escort cars that someone will put together a, a race for them. We thought, quite honestly, that as Freddie was going to try to slide this car around a corner, he would break the wheel off. About a year ago, Freddy Tavares Hernandez, Tyler Hoover, and myself decided that we wanted to play Top Gear, and we came up with this premise called Car Trek. And it was all made possible through a sponsor called Auto Tempest. Obviously, we're all buying cars all the time, usually terrible examples of really cool cars, at least in my case. And so Auto Tempest was a perfect sponsor because that's who we use to search for cars. They allow you to search all the major car listing sites at the same time, and so it was the perfect sponsor to kind of propose the challenges for each of the Car Trek series. So for Car Trek 1, the goal was to find the coolest car we could for the price of a C8 Corvette. And I bought a flood title Lamborghini Gallardo Spider for $59,000, the perfect car for the challenge, but it was very, very close to not being ready in time. It needed a lot of work beforehand, which we kind of, all the cars need some work beforehand, but we don't make a big deal out of that. But this one, I wasn't sure was gonna make it. So I had to buy a backup car. And I told the story of that. It was a 2010 Lamborghini Gallardo Spider with 104,000 miles. Absolute piece of garbage, but it was perfect for the premise as a backup. It would have worked as a first car, but I really didn't know which car I was going to take until right before I left. And I ended up taking the originally planned gated manual flood car. I love that car. I still have it today. As soon as I got back, I sold the Gallardo. But right as we were about to begin filming, Freddy's Aston broke in a pretty catastrophic way. It blew two of the hydraulic lines. It was a V12 Vantage S, and that paddle shift transmission would never work with a big leak in that system. Now, fortunately, after a few hours of working, Freddie and Jared were able to repair that car. In that few hours, I'm going kind of frantically back and forth trying to figure out do we need to send somebody back up six hours to Atlanta from Orlando where we were starting and use that car for Freddie, or were we going to need to buy another Aston Martin locally because it didn't really seem like something that could be easily fixed. Beyond that, the power steering pump sounded like it was about to explode, so Freddie's car was in a bad shape. And so at the end of that filming, even though we were able to fix the Aston, we learned that we need a real backup car. Now, when Tom Gear does these cheap car challenges or these long road trips, in almost every case, they have multiples of each car. Or they've used someone like John Ficara to outsource all the car wrangling. Regardless, the guys never pick their own cars. They're not out shopping and buying and prepping cars. They're, they're presented to them, and then they're presented to the audience as though they brought them. But usually the cars are properly gone through. Everything is done to make them truly reliable, and all of the failures are planned. 
Now, we don't know what we're doing, and we certainly don't have the ability to buy multiples of each car or plan the exact failures of them. We're actually going out there and seeing what happens. And so in Car Trick 1, all the failures of the Gallardo were absolutely legitimate. But as we started to look towards Car Trick 2, with the premise being the most appreciated supercars we could find, we knew that we needed a fourth car as a backup, not a duplicate of one of them like I'd done in the first one with a Gallardo, because it was just as likely that any of us could need them as one of us would need it. And so I was bringing the Colombian Aston Martin Vanquish. I had found a manual transmission Maserati Coupe that Freddie insisted on having, and Tyler had found on eBay through Auto Tempest a CL65. Not exactly a supercar, but at least we had pretty good confidence that it would make it. However, if anything significant on that car broke, it wasn't something we were going to be able to limp along. So we started looking at what would another car be, but really we kept gravitating towards something that was reasonably affordable, had supercar level performance in the same way the CL65 isn't a supercar, this wasn't a supercar, but it was a BMW M6 with the 5 liter V10, a pretty heralded motor, but with a lot of reliability issues. And because of those issues, the car was catastrophically depreciated. And so I was able to find one that had like a $104,000 sticker for just around $9,000. And was shopping through Auto Tempest, found a local listing, in fact, which was wildly convenient. And as I start looking, I recognize the seller as being an old friend of mine. He organizes a car show for all sorts of tuner import cars. I've been to it a few times. And so he has a dealership where he sells a lot of older M cars. And he had this 2007 BMW M6 with 140,000 miles on it. So I call him, he tells me a bit about it. He had picked it up at an auction, I think for like seven grand and had the clutch had failed and the headlights were failing. And so he had done some work. And so he's like, look, I own it for about nine. You can have it for that if you want. It's going to take a couple more weeks. And I said, that is perfect. It was a pretty well-maintained car, but we knew very little about it. Now, of course, on these cars, you have to plan on replacing the rod bearings or they will fail. And there's a car that I owned in the past. I actually bought it, I guess, in 2014, right after we had our son, because I felt like I needed to have a car with a back seat that you could put a car seat in. And I didn't have any other cars that that wouldn't constitute strapping him to a fuel cell from one of the Cannonball cars. And so I bought a 2006 BMW M5. And the only reason I was personally comfortable with owning that car was because it had $48,000 of warranty receipts from the prior year. These cars total themselves because the engines fail, they spin a rod because the rod bearings fail. It's something that they all seem to do. It's a fairly common problem on BMWs in general. The E46 M3 that I just sold in our car flipping contest had just had the rod bearings done because it was popping a check engine light. It's just one of those things that you know. Additionally, on these SMG BMWs, you're going to have clutch failure, pump failure, fluid leaks, all the things that you expect. And so while this car was currently running and we could see that the engine had been resealed, which probably indicated rod bearings, we didn't really know what had been done. Also, it had a very entertaining number of faults. The park distance control was bad. The headlight leveling was bad. Increased emissions, check engine light, but it did pass emissions. It had a gas cap tightness error all sorts of things. So lots of lights on, entertaining for filming, but the car was generally a pretty solid driving car. Had the muffler deleted, sounded pretty good, and they're cool looking cars. I mean, when you think about it, they were a great new car. A lot of people were really excited when the V10 BMWs came out. Of course, now they have a stigma attached to them and people are really, really afraid of owning them. Now, of course, this next bit's going to spoil the premise of Car Trek 2. If you haven't already seen it, please go watch it. It's on Freddy Tavares' channel. But we did end up needing the M6. Now, the general premise with a backup car is that the cars may not make it to the start. Like, we're trying to get these cars ready, ship them across the country, tow them in the case of the Maserati, and we don't know until the very last minute if the cars are actually going to be ready. So the point of the backup car is to just step in and be as though that is the car that this person decided to bring. So I didn't know if the Aston was going to make it. Freddie didn't know if the Maserati was going to make it. We had a pretty good confidence in the CL because it's a Mercedes product and it wasn't currently limping along through any errors and so we have the M6 there and we're just kind of waiting to see but all the cars perform pretty well however in the first inspection of the Maserati by the car wizard which we were already kind of aware of this issue we found that the rear wheel on the passenger side was so loose that it literally could fall off. And so as we headed out to Spring Mountain Motorsports Park, we thought quite honestly that as Freddie was gonna try to slide this car around a corner, he would break the wheel off and that that would be that and that that would be a catastrophic failure and then we would immediately need the M6. 
as it turned out, Freddie spun it around many times, slid it pretty hard, didn't have any issues, laid down the fastest lap time, and so we didn't need the M6 at that moment. However, a very short time later, a uh, minor electrical fire happened, and that was going to be a pretty significant rewiring to part of the harness. A lot of it was melted, and so that was going to take Freddie and Jared quite a bit of time to try to fix. So the M6 comes in. Now, of course, in the storyline, we have to introduce how the M6 came about. We can't make it seem like we knew one of these cars was going to break. And so we create this shtick where I'm on a phone shopping Auto Tempest in Vegas and buying the car in that moment. And of course, that wasn't exactly how it happened. We already had the car. But the next morning, Tyler and I decorate the car sort of like a Maserati and present it to Freddie as a gift. And we go about the next bit of challenges. And so that was to take the car out to the desert. Of course, none of us really love the M6, particularly relative to a manual transmission Maserati, a super cool car. And so Freddie wasn't very excited to be out of the, his first choice car and into the M6. And he was rather abusive to the car as we're sliding it around a dry lake bed. It, of course, the temperature starts to creep up. More aero lights are popping on, but it does hold together and survive pretty well. We do the baby crying challenge and we try to cook something on the hood, which was actually made quite easy because prior to leaving, I had had all the cars coated with Avalon King ceramic coating. In fact, if you click the link in the description below, you can get a great deal on a DIY Avalon King Armor Shield 9 ceramic coating kit. So that meant that the chicken didn't stick to the hood as we were trying to cook it. Of course, that's not the primary use of Avalon King, but it does work for that. So we had a lot of fun with that challenge and obviously found a lot of ways to tie in Auto Tempest, and we certainly appreciated them for making this all possible. Now, that being said, they don't give us a budget to buy all of these cars and never see them again. We have to not lose all that much money on them. And this M6 was in pretty sorry shape at the end of it. So, you know, they help us with the production cost. In fact, Car Trek 1 wouldn't have been possible if it hadn't been for the fact that in late 2019, I had pre-sold all of our 2020 sponsor placements in order to raise money to buy the Mercy SV that was illegally imported from Canada into China and being sold without any paperwork. I was really excited about that car. I'll tell you more about that later. It, of course, it never ended up happening, but that meant that I had raised the money that I could sort of float all the car purchases for the first series. Now, we were using cheaper-ish cars for Car Trek too, but we still didn't want to lose all that much money in them. And so we'll talk more about where the cars ended up. You may see some more of the Aston Martin Vanquish, but we needed to get rid of this M6 at the end of it. And John Ficara, who came in to appraise all the cars at the end after Freddie had resurrected the Maserati, you know, buys the Maserati on screen, but as he really started evaluating that car, he didn't like it at all. And Tyler had a friend who wanted to start making YouTube videos with it. So it went with him. And Ficara decides that he wants to buy the M6 as his means to get home. Of course, it goes about 200 miles before refusing to restart at a gas stop, and it does need gas stops all the time. That is actually the thing that I hate most about those M5s and M6s. They get terrible gas mileage, but everything I own gets terrible gas mileage, but everything else has a larger tank. They have like a 15 and a half, 16 gallon tank, so you're going to stop for gas every 150 miles maybe 100 miles if you drive the car really hard. So it just makes the cars really, really hard to use, despite the fact that the they're really comfortable. I drove the M6 around a good bit before we took it out there to Vegas to film, but none of us were really excited to bring it back home, so we were glad that Fakara wanted it, and you all saw that he recently sold that car. So again, it was a great backup car. It fit exactly what we needed. It did its job, it did its thing, and then it went on to a better place. And I can't wait to see through the VinWiki app what the future owners continue to do with the car that's one of the most interesting things about our app is the chance to see what happens to cars down the road. So be sure to download the app, follow the M6, see what becomes of it, see what happens to all the other Car Trek cars. The Gallardo that I had as a backup car ended up being wrapped in green. It's now with its new owner. It's well past 100,000 miles, obviously, but it's still running very, very strong. So we're thankful to Auto Tempest for making Car Trek possible, and I'm excited to say that we just finished recording Car Trek 3, which will air as our Christmas special in December, so be on the lookout for that on Freddy's channel. Go rewatch Car Trek 1, Car Trek 2, because we have an awful lot of fun making them. I will come to your house and bring you cash. I'm like, right. I love road trips and I've always had this quest for the perfect road trip car. I had owned a 1990 model B 
BMW 5 Series. It's the car from the carjacking story, from the Tia with the Porsche story. And, you know, loved it. I eventually just beat it to death and sold it. But uh, several years had gone by, and I started thinking about another car. Well, a buddy of mine and I that ran the Overland Company, we had sort of been involved in this motor trend project. They were building a track at Road Atlanta, sort of temporary thing to off-road test several of the luxury SUVs of the time. This would have been the M-Class Mercedes and the Lexus RX something and the Infiniti Q something. You know, all those cars, all the Element OP cars. And uh, in that test, now we had nothing to do with the test, but we just kind of consulted building the track, kind of showed them some hills and side hills and that sort of thing. But the BMW X5 did very well. It had the earlier hill descent control. It handled itself off-road better than a lot of these other cars. And you know, my wife and I at the time were looking for something that was comfortable, versatile, you know, sort of fast, sort of fun. I wanted to be able to take it off road. She wanted something that was fast that she could put some rims on it. You know, I wanted something that was fun to drive. And I had loved my five series sedan. It was a right to drive. It was a manual transmission. Love that car. So X5 it is. Sounds great. And this is in probably like 2003, 2002. So I start searching and, uh, you know, there were you know, still fairly expensive cars at the time, but I found one that was a really fantastic, just the most electric blue you've ever seen. And it was about $3,000 under market and it wasn't too far away from where I was. So I, I called the guy and I, you know, the guy had a very heavy Middle Eastern accent. So I started asking about the car and he said, well, you know, the car is fine. He said, I'm having a hard time selling it, uh, you know, because people hear my accent, they ask me if this is going to go to fund terrorism. You know, and this is only about 18 months to two years after 9-11. So I guess tensions were still high and the guy seemed like a delightful guy but he just seemed to be you know feeling like he couldn't move the car people were refusing to buy the car particularly because of his accent and i said well you know is the car okay he said oh it's it's great he said i just uh i just can't move it so uh i lowered the price a bit and i said well hey that works for me i'll come check it out so he gives me an address and i'm in athens i drive down to macon georgia i get to the guy's house and it's this really, really impressive gated neighborhood. And Macon's not really known for its wealth, but this guy must have had it all. This was an amazing house. The house is all white, all these beautiful white cars, you know, another nice BMW, another nice Mercedes, a lot of German stuff in the driveway. Fantastic house. You know, go up, ring the doorbell. It's one of those doorbells that rings for like 30 seconds, takes some big tune. And a very beautiful woman comes to the door, ushers us inside, and uh, the guy comes up to meet me. And he is dressed, you know, not fancy, but, you know, he had these kind of look like hand-woven linen slippers and kind of very billowy, kind of look like something like Ralph Lauren would wear on the beach. You know, had a lot of gold jewelry on. He had a cocaine nail about this long on his pinky finger. A delightful guy. You know, he's definitely got the sort of drug lord vibe about him, but he's a very pleasant dude. And I asked him a little more about the car, and he said, well, what I do here is I buy these luxury SUVs in the United States, and I ship them to my brother in Yemen, and he sells them there, and we split the money. But this car was the wrong color. Tell me about the color. He said, well, you know, in the Middle East, uh, if you were somebody of prestige, you drive a, a white car, maybe a gold car. If you are a little lower down the social scale, you might drive a, a neutral, you know, a silver, gray, or a black car. But only the, the low-down people are going to drive, you know, blue or green or yellow or red. Those cars are not considered classy cars. It's like, okay, you know, so I take it out for spin. The car is fantastic. It's everything I hoped it would be. It's fast. It handles well. So we do the deal. I get the car. I drive the car back. Well, it was only a couple of years old, so I was still able to get the BMW extended warranty. Even though I bought it used, I purchased the warranty because, you know, there was some expensive stuff that could go wrong with this car. I get the warranty, and in very short order, little things just started going wrong with this car. Uh, now, it always drove, and it always drove beautifully, but it would just be, you know, window won't go up, window won't go down. Um, the you know, some the rain sensing windshield wiper thing loses its mind and the windshield wipers run nonstop every time a bird poops on it. Just little stuff like that. Uh, one of the more entertaining ones, the heated seat on the driver's side would not turn off. And, you know, I'll take you to the dealership and they're like, well, you know, it's not, we can't find a fault. So the warranty's not going to cover it. And, you know, we debated back and forth on that. And I was like, you know, figured out. They're like, well, you got to leave the car with us so we can figure it out. I'm like, well, you've had it for two weeks. Can we just, you do some research, call me back because I can't really do it without the car. So I'm driving around. I'm like, like, I'll just cut the wires to the seat. They're like, no, 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 you can't do that. If you do it, it'll freak out the computer system 
and this other stuff won't work. And I was like, oh my God. So uh, I drive it, um, you know, get that sorted. What would usually go down is some random thing would go wrong with the car. I would call them. They'd want me to drop the car off. The car would sit there for two weeks until they got to it. Then they would try to fix it, but then they would come back to me and say, well, you know, our guy's been to Germany. He's got a lab coat on. This thing's just too complex. We can't figure out what the problem is. Warranty is only going to cover one thing. So you pay one and we'll pay the other one. And, and I was like, no, 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 it doesn't work like that. So they always ended up paying for it, but it always required me having to go in there two times, 10 phone calls, writing a letter, et cetera. So it was a little frustrating. You know, there was always some check engine light on, always some ABS thing. There's always some little fidgety thing wrong with this car. So after a couple of years of this, you know, I am just done with this car. You know, the heated seats won't go off. I'm driving around on a beach towel. I can't cut the wire because it'll freak out the ski package. There's always just some little thing. Now I'm trying to sell it, but I can't get the check engine light to go off. What can we do? They're, uh, they're like, well, you know, just give it to us for two weeks and we'll run our diagnostics. We'll figure out what the problem is. So I'm like, okay, fine. They call me back and they say, we've narrowed it down to one of three problems. They're each about $1,600. Warranty's only going to cover one. We'll pay that one and you pay the other two and problem solved. And I'm like, no, nah, it doesn't work that way. I just had enough. And uh, the service writer guy by the name of Mike um, was up out of his desk and I literally just sat down at his desk and I was like, Mike, Every time this car breaks, I have to arm wrestle you. I have to arm wrestle your manager. I got to threaten to call the paper, chain myself to the door handle, something. And you always fix it in the end. Can we just skip all that and just get to fixing it? And he's like, nope, sorry. You know, the warranty only covers one thing. It's your car. You want it fixed. You have to pay the other two. I'm like, it's not going to work that way. I'm like, seriously, that's going to go down, Mike. I'm going to sit here in your desk. You're going to have to either drag me out of here, in which case you're going to have a fight on your hands, or you can call the police, at which point I will call the newspaper and we can all have a big discussion about it. Or you can fix my car. So he stomps off and I sat at his desk for about 45 minutes. And uh, this is, again, probably 2004, 2005. I don't have a smartphone, so I just doodling on his desk pad and I just hung out at his desk for about an hour. So he comes back with his manager. The manager's like, what do we got to do to get you out of Mike's desk without a physical altercation? And I'm like, fix my car. You know, I gave you the money for the warranty. You said you'd cover the things. This is how it works. You know, you take my money, you deliver the service. If not, we got a problem. So as always, they agree to fix it. Problem solved, check engine lights off, and I get this thing on eBay Motors as quickly as I could. Now this is 17, 18 years ago, 15 years ago. This is before Auto Tempest and Bring a Trailer and Craigslist and all that. So I put it on eBay Motors. The truck looked really nice, actually. We had put some, uh, you know, put some 20 inch rims on it, which weren't like the blinged out tacky kind. They looked, they're kind of the Alpina style, you know, looked like they came with it from the factory, just kind of filled out the wheel wells a little better. The outside tire diameter was actually the same as stock. It was just more rimless tire, so it didn't mess with the gearing or the speedometer or anything like that. Um, put a good stereo system in it. Uh, taking good care of the car. It was a great car, a great looking car. Nothing happens for a week. Hardly anybody even looks at it. So I relist it. And within five minutes, I get ding, get a little email. Your item has been purchased with buy it now. And I get an email another minute or two later, you know, hello, sir or ma'am. Thank you for your item on eBay. I would very much like to purchase it. Will you accept check from Kazakhstan bank? And I'm thinking like, all right, this is one of those foreign scam things, you know, not to profile anybody, but you know, obviously broken English and the foreign check, you know, this just sounds like a red flag. So I write the, the person back and say, you know, thank you for your purchase. As the auction stated, however, cash or a certified check from US bank only, you know, if you cannot accommodate this, please let me know and we can make other arrangements. I can relist the car. And the guy writes back and said, no, no, no. My brother lives in New York City. I was gonna come and visit him anyway. I will come to your house and bring you cash. I'm like, right. So I had a busy week planned. So I'm already in the back of my mind thinking how I'm going to have to arm wrestle eBay to get my $300 listing fee back. And I kind of put it out of my mind. But I'd sent the guy the address just for giggles, just to kind of see, you know, let's see how far he wants to take this scam. I'm sitting in my studio working on a piece of artwork. And my studio faced the street in my house. This was in Athens, Georgia. And I'm sitting there drawing. And... A van pulls up in front of my house. I look out, it is the Hartsfield Airport parking lot shuttle van 
which is 65 miles away from where we are. The shuttle van pulls up in front of my house and two foreign guys get out. They've got shorts and tank tops, flip flops on, no luggage, and a shaving bag with $28,500 in non-sequential 20s in it. Come to the door, hello, I'm here for the car. I'm like, wow, this is what I get for profiling people. I didn't expect to see you. It was the guy and his brother, he'd flown to New York, picked up his brother, they hopped a plane, flew to Atlanta, paid the guy from the Hartsfield van to drive them to Athens to my house, picked up the car. He's very insistent I count the cash, and I did. I, you know, laid it out on the counter, and, you know, $28,500 in 20s is a pretty good stack of money. So I'm, sure enough, it's all there, and he was very insistent I counted it all. And he said, okay, you know, thanks a lot. We'll take the car now. I was like, uh, where are you, you taking it? He said, I'm going to take it to Savannah and put it on a container and ship it back to Kazakhstan. I was like, okay. I said, well, to be honest with you, I didn't expect to, to see you here. And, uh, you know, if I had known that a legitimate buyer was from overseas, I probably would have waved you off because, you know, uh, there's a BMW dealership right down the road and I have difficulty getting this thing fixed here sometimes. Do you have access to a dealership or somewhere where you are in Kazakhstan that can keep this thing going? And he said, uh, you know, well, I know people. I was like, okay. I said, well, I think it was like a Saturday morning or something like that. And I said, well, you know, I still owe a little bit of money on the car. And as the auction stated, you know, I need to get the title, ship it to you. So I'm going to take your cash, pay the car off. Where can I send the title? And the guy says, ah, Kazakhstan, you have the car, you own the car. I was like, well, I kind of want to do something with it. He's like, ah, send it to my brother. You know, I don't really care. I'm just going to take it. I'm like, okay. So I take the $28,500 in non-sequential 20s. They get in the car and drive away. And... I never heard another thing about it until about six months later, I got a letter from the, I don't know if it was the NTSB or whoever would oversee this sort of thing. And they basically said, you know, you sold a car, but it was never re-registered in the United States. What happened to it? And there was like a checkbox for like, you know, total per private collection sold overseas. So I checked the over sold overseas and sent it away. And I, I hope they had good luck with the car. The guy seemed like a delightful guy, but somewhere in the back of my mind, I know that thing is over there right now hooked to a team of horses with the check engine light on because they can't get it fixed either. It was the color I wanted. It was the year I wanted, the last year built. I happened to be born in that year. And I mean, it's like my perfect M1. The M1 is not a car that many people have had the chance to, to drive, uh, let alone see. You know, 399 of these were built for the street, 54 of them in pro car, or pro car so a you know, total of 453 of these cars total built. For the guy that created a business focusing only on M cars, and, and if I want one of all of the analog M cars, there's got to be an M1 in our stable. And I had the opportunity to buy a fantastic example back in 2012. Our business is just getting started. We're just starting to make some money. We're just starting to really figure out our, our direction and path. And the workshop is just starting to get going. And, and you know, we didn't have what we didn't, while we were doing it, we didn't deem it a rejuvenation program back then. We were just making the cars as nice as we knew to back then. And uh, I had a really great client in, in Southern California that we'd done a, a lot of deals with. He'd been, become a, a really great friend over the years and decided that he wanted to sell his M1, which was the third M1 of his uh, stepping stones and getting you know to the best he could find. So it's a 1981 white, beautiful, beautiful car. Had very low mileage, 20,000 miles thereabouts. And the M1s you know got down to 70, 80, 90 thousand dollars back in the mid 2000s. Uh, they started going up uh, shortly thereafter that, but not by much. Uh, I think we bought the car in. I think it might have been 2011. I think we paid. I, I we know exactly we paid 200 thousand dollars. The car was just I just paid for it got it on a truck uh enclosed of course and we had done uh, a couple deals with a gentleman in the chicagoland area a very uh, big car enthusiast has a huge uh, collection he sells me this silver on red m5 back it was a good exchange and uh, i was feeling pretty good about the relationship uh, i let him know that i had just bought this m1 it's on its way to cincinnati and he says well I got to have that car. I'm like, well, let me get it here. Let me go through it. Let me vet it. Let me do all my stuff. No, no, I, I want, I want the car. Uh, you pick a number, put a number on it, and uh, if it's fair, we'll, we'll get it done. And uh, you know, I 
again, was, had probably 10 employees at the time and, and had relatively low overhead compared to what we're uh, looking at now. And, um, you know, but, you know, 10% is always a great, you know, rule to run by uh, in selling any product or wear. And, and if you can sell it, you know, within a week or so of owning it and make 10%, that's a good car deal. So we end up agreeing at uh, 218,500. I remember it very clearly. So not quite our 10%, but close enough and uh, keeping a good customer happy. First M1 that we ever bought, I'm missing my opportunity to drive it. I'm missing the ownership experience, albeit for a day or two. I mean, I've been looking forward to having an M1 ever since I learned what one was, which didn't even know what, what it was for quite a few years into the hobby uh, within the BMW brand. That was a really fantastic car by the pictures because <laughs> uh, that's as close as I ever got to the car. Well, we reroute the truck. It's not too terribly far to go to Chicago if you're coming to Cincinnati when you're coming from California. And, uh, but, you know, hey, remember, you know, our thing is, is when you're done with the car, have fun with it, take great care of it, enjoy it. If you need anything along the way, we're here to help you. But when you're done, please give us that first option, that first right of refusal, that courtesy, that human decency of we're having this conversation, look me in the eye, shake my hand. You're going to give us a call to make a market correct offer to buy the car back. Well, uh, he did with his M5. So we've got a track record. It's a good thing going. So why would I not think that I'm going to get the M1 back? The car gets there. He's happy with the car. Don't hear from him uh, for a couple months. Thinking we should probably be doing another car deal by about now since he's got this much uh, other stuff going on. And, and out of the blue, my, my, uh, my phone rings. Hey, Eric. Uh, oh, hello. Hey, uh, by the way, I just want to let you know I sold the M1. It's going to France. I made $50,000 on you. Thanks. See ya. Bye. That was not very nice. I don't understand why that phone call took place. Uh, out of the blue like that. There was nothing that prefaced that conversation. That's the last time I've spoken with that individual. I was pretty upset because now I've got this car that I really wanted to have back. I bought it from a very dear personal friend. I told him I'm going to keep the car in a great home. I Now, you know, while I probably wouldn't have been able to keep the car back then at that time, fiscally speaking, I still wanted it in my network because eventually at some point I planned on probably owning that car. It was the color I wanted. It was the year I wanted, the last year built. I happened to be born in that year. And I mean, it's like my perfect M1, owned by a friend. And now it's somewhere in Europe and still have not uh, uh, found that car. Probably need to use some of uh, our uh, VIN uh, researching tools to, to find this specific car. Uh, I know a guy. That set me up though for a hunt that has then went on now for the following six years post. The BMW Car Club uh, has a really tight-knit community. Uh, the BMW CCA is the largest uh, car club, I think, of any car club, uh, over 80,000 members strong, um, which is, I believe, the largest car club in the world. They have a really great foundation from a management standpoint, uh, management level. And the very first uh, executive director of the BMW Car Club, uh, Gordon Medenica, was obviously a big enough fan of the of the brand to, to step up and volunteer his time to, to help uh, build this club up to what we know it to be today uh, with what uh, he could bring to that position. And a big E30 M3 fan, he owned one, uh, showed at the Greenwich Concours and, and uh, uh, super gorgeous white, uh, 1990, 24,000 miles. I end up finding that car. Uh, one owner removed from his ownership, I buy it and add it to our collection in 2013. I learned who Gordon is through this exercise. Well, Gordon uh, also loves the M1 so much that he decides to start the uh, registry of, of uh, basically where are all the good M1s. He starts um, this registry and gets uh, of the 450 three M1s gets close to half of these things um, located over a 15 year or so period. And he has a really gorgeous red M1 that he'd owned now for about 10 years. And one of his things was, you know, I love this car, but everybody stops and asks me, is that a Lamborghini? Is that a Ferrari? Is, is that this? It's red. And he's like, I love the car. But, you know, red's just not doing it. And so I need to find the best white one I can find. The absolute best white one I can find. Well, he was successful. Uh, granted, he'd built up a really great set of resources. And, and in 1997, uh, he does. He finds this car that uh, was originally uh, purchased by Ralph Lauren. Uh, Ralph uh, apparently had owned a couple M1s, but uh, uh, this white one was one of the later ones being an 81. 
And he uh, uh, owned the car for a number of years, I think 11 or so, and uh, sold the car. That's the only bit of paperwork that doesn't exist for this car that I've not been able to find, albeit have talked to several guys that uh, know Ralph and know uh, the storyline of this car, I remember seeing it in, in the window, so to speak. And uh, sells the car to Bill Jacobs up in Chicago, Bill Jacobs BMW, another big motorsport fan, has a nice little collection, very big driver, uh, and his, uh, his boys have taken over the dealership upon his passing, and I've spoken with these guys, and they remember seeing the car, they sent me pictures of the car in his care. This car is still super low mileage at this time. 1997, uh, he sells the car and, uh, and Gordon buys it. Well, Gordon now has his white car that he's been looking for for all of these years. It's the best one he could ever find and uh, sells the, the red one to a very dear friend of mine in Cincinnati of all things, which I just learned this maybe two years ago, that these two cars now live in the same city. Gordon proceeds to have the car for the next 10 years. And everything that he's learned in the 15 years prior to that, focusing, studying, learning everything on the BMW M1, now goes into this car that was originally imported into the United States. It was federalized as was required at the time to bring one of these cars into a, a non-domestic market. And he basically puts the car all back to Euro spec, the way that it uh, was produced with the exception of the side uh, uh, fillers. Uh, you still gotta open the rear windows and stick your uh, uh, nozzles in, which there's two gas tanks on the M1, which is really kind of cool if you pull into the right gas station because if they're close enough, you can go and fill both tanks at the same time, which if you own an M1, you've got to figure out a spot to do that at least one point. And I've only been able to do that one time in life, but it was so rewarding. <laughs> so the car is honest and as well-preserved as, as it can physically be. And uh, he's, his ownership has run its course and he decides that he's going to get out of the BMW game. He's going to hang up the hat from the position of uh, executive director and all the other different the responsibilities that he had and, and sell off his, his BMWs. Um, so this is uh, when he sells the M1 to Bobby Rahal. Bobby is quite the, uh, the driver, as we all know, certainly a BMW uh, enthusiast and fan to the point of having a franchise dealership in uh, Pennsylvania and uh, has not been a stranger to the M1 ownership circle. And so now he owns the car for about a, a year and uh, something new and shiny catches his eye, which happens to all of us that have AADD, uh, Automotive Attention Deficit Disorder. And uh, he sells the car to a gentleman by the name of Archie Archioli, uh, which I just recently became uh, aware of how to pronounce his name properly. It's not exactly a, a, an easy one when you're looking at it. Well, Archie was a very diehard, uh, is a still a very diehard uh, enthusiast of all things BM, or BMW, but also just motorsport in general. A lot of really great big cars. Uh, he owned the car for the next decade or so, uh, took just, I mean, just meticulous care of the car. The M1 registry uh, reins were passed to another gentleman in Texas. And Mr. Mike Yura, who's uh, again become a, a good friend over the years, thankfully to say, knew that I'd been looking for all this time, I reached out to Mike in 2012 or 13, I think, when I reached out to the M1 registrar to say, hey, I, this one M1 got away. I'm now getting close. I will be at this point. I want the best M1. I really want to find a white one. I really want, I'm doing everything I tell my clients not to do. You don't get to buy for color. You don't get to buy for a year. You don't get to buy for this option or that option. I mean, you, you do that, you're going to buy the wrong car. Quality control has to come first. So I'm going to every auction, I'm going looking at every M1 listing, every M1 that I could physically get my hands on to try to evaluate, try to replace this white car that was taken from me, so to speak. I eventually connected with Mike and, and added him to the, the team of, of, of friends and enthusiasts that are on the lookout. So I get the call in 2018 that this white M1 is going to be coming up and uh, he really wants to sell it by interview to a degree and, and uh, the M1 registrar is, is kind of a running point to, uh, on it and um, felt honored to get that phone call and, and reviewed everything on the car and it was just, I mean, it was a, as a no-brainer other than how much money I was going to have to plunk down now that I'm going to be paying a pretty good size multiple of what I lost out on uh, just six years prior. That's the nature of the market. I can't hate on, uh, on the function of, of the best cars getting more expensive as they grow in popularity and demand with those that have the financial fortitude to buy what they want. And uh, I just happened to uh, come to the market a bit too late and missed out on that opportunity, which is a really hard emotion to, to get over when that one got away because most everything else doesn't compare to it. Today, we still have the M1. I have put 
15 to 20 percent of the the kilometers on the car i've put on myself i've driven the car on track i've driven the car on road trips to bmw spartanburg and uh went to the the plant in the zentrum museum uh, hung out with our good friend uh, ken sparks who was the bmw uh, spokesperson for a decade and drove the car on track with him with his uh, eag m5 uh, alpine white that he bought from us uh, just a couple months prior to that and uh, being able to get the car out and showing it to people and, and s seeing the reactions and sit in it, drive it, let's go for a ride um, has been quite rewarding. And the best part, I think, about the whole story for me is I had built this just acquaintance, slight relationship with Gordon Bedenica, who was the, you know, the guy that really uh, cataloged all these top M1s um, by VIN number, of course, but I'd never met him. I talked to him on the phone maybe a handful of times. And I just pulled in real late uh, uh, during Oktoberfest 2018 in, in South Carolina, it's in Greenville. And I pull up to the host hotel, I park right up front like I own the place because I'm driving an M1 and that's where they wanted it parked and nice lights and like perfect photo opportunity. I get in and they're finishing a little seminar. As the seminar is coming out, some friends from the club say, yeah, yeah, uh, Gordon's on his way here. I'm like Gordon, Gordon, Gordon Denica. Like, are you kidding me? Like, that's his old car. And here, 35 minutes later, here comes Gordon, uh, and I get to finally meet this guy that had been uh, the curator and, and custodian of this car for a decade, and the following uh, day, or I think maybe the day after that, uh, we end up um, meeting up, and I'm like, uh, jump in, you're driving, uh, tell me the whole story, and we go for a good ride, and, and uh, basically reunited him with his old car, and, and you know, he you know, pretty much uh, got out of the hobby for quite a long time, and just this was, I think, maybe his first uh, uh, re-entrance back into the the community again and seeing all these old friends after a long time and so being able to meet him and, and as I'm driving his car I just total random happen chance was uh, uh, I got goosebumps just even thinking about it, doing it and, and uh, everything happens for a reason and that, uh, that's my M1 story. He just sees my face he's on the phone and he just freezes and now I'm really nervous something's up. So I have a horror story to tell you, and I know a lot of folks have come in here and told you horror stories about dealerships, and I hate to talk badly about any particular dealership, but this was a nightmare for me, one of the, one of the most stressful moments of my life. Back in 2002, I was lucky enough to put my pennies together and order uh, an E46 M3. This is when the E46 had first come out, and a good buddy of mine had just bought one, and he had the SMG gearbox, which I was really intrigued by. I'm a manual guy, I would have ordered a manual, but my buddy Scott like kind of convinced me to order an SMG and I had driven his and I was intrigued by it. And what I loved about that gearbox and any single clutch electro hydraulic box is that as a driver, you're part of the equation. Yes, they're clunky. If you leave them in the automatic mode, first of all, you're an idiot. Why would you buy that gearbox and not shift the paddles? And how hard is it to pull a damn paddle? So anybody that complains about the SMG gearbox or any F1 gearbox in Ferraris or even the Maserati Quattroporte back in the day, because it's clunky and automatic is an idiot. Never drive those things in automatic. Shift the damn paddles, right? I ordered the SMG. So here's the thing with the E46 M3. Yes, the E30 is the poster child for M cars, but if you drive it an E30 today, super lithe and nimble and it corners well, but no go, no power. Stock on those goofy little wheels, it just didn't, I don't know, it didn't hold up. But amazing car, look, it's the icon, right? And the racing successes, Enough said, E30 is the E30, the holy grail, I guess, of M cars. But the E36 that followed, way superior car, especially the Euro version. Amazing, big jump to the E36, six cylinder over four cylinder. Yes, it got a little heavier, but still super nimble car by today's standards, still lightweight. And of course it was the lightweight version. But then the jump from E36 to E46, I think was almost like a two generational jump. I liken it to the jump from F430 to 458. That was massive. That was almost like a three generation jump for Ferrari. But the thing to keep in mind, which we were talking about earlier, the E46 came out in a time when what we would consider supercars today were, obviously they were the, the pinnacle at the time, but they weren't quite supercars. Ferrari 360, Porsche 911 turbos, which have always been amazing. And, and the 360 itself, a pretty big jump for Ferrari from 355 to 360. Electro hydraulic gearbox. I mean, it was an amazing car, but 
the E46 M3 when it launched wasn't that far off of those cars. What made the E46 so amazing to me is that it was a usable everyday car. The build quality had gone significantly up from the E36 as well. The materials inside and when the door shut, it, there was just this German solidity that the Germans have that reputation but had kind of started to lose it. That car had it and it just felt like a lot of car, especially for the money and the performance wise, it did, like I said, 80, 90%, 95% of what the supercars of the day did. So that's why that car, for those of us that have sort of had experience through E30, E36, E46, E90, E92, if we're talking about the coupe and even F80, the current car that's now going away, that car is kind of the, the sweet spot. I was a little nervous because I kind of couldn't really afford this car. I was definitely gonna be car poor, but I just could, right? Not the most responsible decision uh, to make. Order the car, it arrives, and I'm like a kid before, uh, Christmas uh, that morning when I drive up to get the car and I bought it at a dealership that was about an hour from my home even though there were three dealerships closer to me because my friend Scott that I mentioned earlier had bought his previous BMWs from this dealership his family had purchased lots of cars from them they were a known quantity and and friends of my friends so no problem and they they gave me the car at sticker which at the time you could get but it, it, you have to work a little bit to get it. Show up to pick up my car, and I remember as I'm signing the papers, and I, they give me the keys, and I'm in it. I remember pulling out of the dealership on PCH there in Newport Beach, thinking, at some point they're gonna stop me. They can't give me, I can't, I have this car? I was blown away by the car. I think it took me that weekend to put the 1,200 miles on it for the braking, because you can't, you couldn't go full throttle, couldn't go over 100 miles an hour, a bunch of stuff you can't do in those cars, and the braking procedure was pretty critical. We would later find out it was really critical because I had to rebuild all the bottom ends on those cars, but I followed it to a T, and I called the dealership, I'm like, okay, I'm ready for my 1,200 mile braking, because after the 1,200 mile braking, all bets are off, you can hammer down. So I, I remember I called him, and it was, I, I exaggerated, it was, probably took me that week, because I remember I took the car on a Friday for the 1,200 mile inspection, drove the hour out of my way to take it in, and my plan was to wait for the car. And I'm super OCD, you know that about me. I write down, I stop, I write down the mileage on the car. Before I would ever take my car to the dealership, I'd make sure it was washed, because the dealership would wash it for you, but they're never gonna wash your car the way we wash our cars. So the car was clean, and I'd tell them every time, no need to wash it, it's fine. And I even I remember asking them, and I knew the answer, because it's that, that 1200 mile inspection is an oil change, a differential change, which is kind of the key and a couple other little items. And I said, do you guys need to drive the car? And he said, no. I'm like, all right, cool, so I'm gonna wait for the car. And he's like, well, we're really busy, and he's like, I'm gonna need it over the weekend. I'm thinking, no, over the weekend? You're freaking nuts. And then he goes, well, we got the, the new seven series. I can put you in a seven series for the weekend. And as a car guy, I'll, I wanna drive the new seven series. So I reluctantly agreed. I took the seven series home for the weekend, thoroughly enjoyed that. Come Monday, as soon as the dealership's open, 7.30, service department, I'm calling, I'm like, hey, I'm ready to pick my car up. And S gets on and goes, well, Emil, we were a little bit busier than we thought. We didn't get to your car. Give me till tomorrow. And now I'm like, mm, I want my car. 1,200 mile break and done so I can hammer down on the thing. But what am I gonna do? So now I'm waiting until Tuesday. In the back of my mind, a little doubt started creeping in. Like, what's going on here? Tuesday, 7.30, boom. Well, we might need the car for another day. I'm like, S what's up with my car? And he finally tells me, he goes, well, one of the mechanics put a little scratch on the front fender, just a little itty bitty scratch. We're fixing it. I'm gonna show you where it is when you come up and see the car. And then, you know, if you're not happy with it, we'll, we'll figure out how to get you happy with it. And now my blood pressure is going up and I'm getting really nervous. But what am I gonna do? I, I kind of have to agree, right? And then as I hang up the phone, I'm like, something, it's like to trust your instincts, right? Something isn't quite right. And so I get in the seven series and I start driving to the dealership and I'm about 15 minutes away and I call him and I said, hey, by the way, I'm heading up. I'll see you in about an hour. And he starts hemming and hawing and now I know something's up. And I'm very close now, but now I'm getting on the gas even more so. And I show up to the dealership, not an hour later as he expected, and he turns into a goat. He's white. He just sees my face, he's on the phone and he just freezes. And now I'm really nervous, something's up. Again, I can barely afford this car. This is my baby. So I walk up to him, he hangs up the phone, and I'm like, I'm here to see, I need to see my car. I, I need to see my car now. And he goes, um, okay, give me a second, let me make a call. He makes a call, he hangs up, and now he's, weirdly, he's kind of calmed down. He goes, all right, where, where's the seven series? And I go right there, and he goes, well, let's jump in it. And I'm like, I need, I just wanna see my car. And he goes, yeah, it's not, it's off site. I throw him the keys, we get in the car, we drive off site to their body shop, essentially, okay? Now I'll paint this picture come up the driveway and it's like chain link fence because they don't care how the body shop looks, right? There's cars everywhere. And as we pull in to the right, I see a steel gray E46 M3, but it's covered in plastic and clearly has been thoroughly repainted. So 
not my car as far as I'm concerned. I'm looking to the left, we park, he gets out, I get out, and I'm trying to find my car as the owner of the body shop or the guy that runs the body shops walks out and he's, he's the typical like mustached, greasy body shop owner guy, right? And he walks up and he goes, oh, your car's over here. And he points at the car that I saw on the way in that I know isn't my car. And so he starts walking towards the car and I'm, I turn, I start walking behind him going like, no freaking, this is not my car, right? And as we get to the car, I realize the entire body side of the car has been repainted. Not like the front fender and a scratch has been touched up. Not only has it been repainted, they, they painted the car in the wrong color gray because it's faded in past the door into the rear fender and it doesn't match. Forget that the texture doesn't match, the orange peel on it. It's a different color. And as I'm looking at it, the guys, I hear the guy talking to me and I'm just, I'm seeing red, like the red mist is, it's on, right? I'm looking at the black shadow, black trim, overspray, clear on it. I'm just telling you the story right now, I'm getting a little worked up, right? And this guy's talking to me. I finally turn to the guy, I'm like, will you shut the, you know what up? I don't know what you did to that car. That is no longer my car. And I took turn to the, the service managers and I'm like, get me back to the dealership right now. And the other guy keeps yapping at me. And I, I don't know how I didn't fly off the handle and deck him. Now, I know not to do that, but I am so fired up now. A former me would have knocked the guy, the you know what out. Get back in the BMW, back to the dealership. On the way back, I call my friend, Scott, who was my connection to the dealership. And I said, you better get to BMW because I'm about to get arrested. And Scott just hangs up the phone. This is the kind of, he's like a brother for me. This is the kind of communication we have, right? But Scott was the president of Sparco USA at the time. And they're 20 minutes away from this dealership. So I'm going to get arrested. I'm beating someone's ass, right? Get to the dealership. The service manager hasn't even stopped the seven series and I'm out the door and I make, and I'm, by the way, now I'm seeing myself from outside, outer body experience. I'm not in control. I am not in control. I make a beeline through the dealership to the GM of the dealership at the time, storm into his office full steam. And there's a couple in there, like their early 60s sitting in the chairs, chairs like this side by side. And I go right between them, hand on the desk, and I'm yelling over the desk and I'm finger in his face. You're effing dealership wrecked my effing car and you tried to effing lie to me about it that in a volume appropriate for a helipad so the whole dealership has now stopped right then i feel a hand on me and, and i go to turn around i'm like i am coiled and ready to attack and i turn it's my buddy scott and i'm like thinking to myself how did you possibly get here it turns out he was down the street at a sandwich shop when i said get to bmw because i'm about to get arrested and he knows me puerto rican hot blooded so he dropped a sandwich and went to the dealership probably saved me from doing something really stupid. So anyway, he calms me down. The dealership is like, Emil, we're gonna fix your car. And I kept on, that's not my car. That's your car. That's not my car. That's not my, we'll fix it for you. I'm not fixing it for me. You're fixing it for you. I want a new car. I want a new car. Scott calms me down. I leave. The most stressful three or four days of my life follow. I finally called a friend who's an attorney and I didn't really want to do that, but I, I'm thinking these guys are trying to screw me. Every time I would talk to them, they're think, they're, their message to me was like, we're going to fix it. We're going to make it right. We'll give you your car back. And I would remind them, not my car. I don't want that car. Because I'm the way we are about cars. That I, Who knows? Oh, by the way, they weren't supposed to drive the car. I pull out my mileage log. The car had been driven 17 miles. Not two miles, not seven miles, 17 miles. Someone was out hot dogging the hell out of that car. So this attorney friend finally says to me, okay, Emil, Firstly, you gotta calm down. This is like five, six days later and I'm still amped up. He goes, I want you to calm down, go back to the dealership, call, call and at, make an appointment to see him in the GM, sit down with him and, and very calmly, as calmly as you can muster, say to him, here's what's gonna happen today. I'm either gonna order my brand new E46 M3, my next one, or I'm walking down the street to the Porsche dealership, I'm gonna buy a brand new 911 and you guys are gonna pay for it. And so I did that and the GM looked at me and said, give me a moment, went upstairs to, I guess, upper management, whoever the heck happened to be upstairs, came back down with a sales guy, uh, whose name I can't remember, he was amazing, Australian guy. And he goes, Neil, this is your new sales guy, such and such, go sit down with him and order your new M3. I just didn't think it was gonna happen that smoothly and go that well. So it did, I went, the bummer of it was that my car was steel gray, steel gray was discontinued. I, I ordered silver gray, sight unseen. It turns out the color was beautiful and I was very happy with it. Had to wait four months for the car. And so in the four months that it took to build my car and bring it to the US, I had a brand new seven series, all fuel paid for. Anytime that stopped the dealership, they would wash the car for me. And that seven series, I got all of it out of that car. All my friends drove it. One of my friends took it to Vegas with a bunch of his buddies. So it was cool to have that seven series. And it was also cool to get a new M3, even though it wasn't the color I originally wanted. I fell in love with the color, but let me tell you, what a stressful moment it was in my life. And I've had to go back and do it again. And even if I would have gotten that 911, I just as soon not 
have that experience because it was massively stressful. The last photo I got was like crossing 127, so I was probably somewhere north of 130 at the time. My first car was an 89 525 that had like been in my family forever um, and it was beat to hell but I like little by little fixed it up and then started um, trying to make it into like a fake E34 and 5 right um, and I probably wasted a lot of money doing that. I had blown out the differential messing around with it and the car was inoperable and so I had to get it towed. Funny enough, I was so convinced that the car was like totaled that I actually, on the side of the street in Boston where it was parked kind of near Harvard's campus, I like literally just started taking the car apart. Like I started taking the door panels out, like just pieces off and I was like, I'll get it towed. And I realized that actually this might be salvageable. So I started like putting it back together. So I get the car towed and the guy was a real jerk. You know, he was outsourced from AAA and real jerk and um, you know, hoist the car up, we take off, and I'm behind it in my roommate's car from college. And we were on uh, Mount Auburn along the river. And as he took a corner, the car came off the tow truck and like went into a, um, it wasn't like a, a telephone pole, it was like one of those big like transformer boxes that just sits there, right? And I was like, boom, like just like hit it hard. And that's a big stationary mass. And I was just like, I mean, I was watching my car go down the street with no driver, then off the road, like, hit. It was crazy. And um, the guy comes out blaming me. He says, whatever you did to this car, it, like, locked up in the back, and it pulled it off the tow truck. And it just turned out he had never, like, secured the tires down. He just lifted it up and went. And um, the craziest coincidence is that a guy who watched it happen was like, hey, I saw the whole thing. Not only will I be a witness, but I know the owner of that tow truck company. Um, and with my mom being a lawyer, she like called them. We had that evidence from the guy, the witness statement from the guy. And I ended up getting like twice the value of the car and got to keep it. I've tried to have a couple, I've had a couple of M cars. I've had, um, had an E36 M3 after my E46. Um, and then I got an E39 M5 finally and wanted it. Uh, I would have kept that car, but it had some misfires. And it spooked me, although nothing was wrong with the car, it just spooked me. Um, sold a guy who knew that because he read the codes and he was fine. He got a good deal. I made, I made some money. He got a good deal too. Um, and then I most recently bought an E34 M5, which kind of like came full circle to getting the car of my dreams. But in between that, I've had a couple E30s. Um, I E30s. Had, I've had two 2002s that have never run. I bought them, never got them running, and passed them on to someone else. Um, and then I had two Bavarias, uh, a 73 and a 74, that I accidentally bought both of on the same day on eBay. It was kind of a mistake. I was trying to like play this bidding game and I ended up winning both cars. Um, so I went to college and probably around my senior year, I was like, okay, well, I'm, I'm working in a lab, I'm, I'm TAing some courses, like put this money away. And I even made a, like, a little kind of fundraising chart uh, with like, hey, you need 17.5 to get some E46 M3 or M5, E39 M5 at the time. Um, let's just kind of keep saving. And of course, like the saving didn't really work out. But when I graduated and like the day I got my first job, I was like, I'm going to get an M car. I don't know what one, but it's going to be the E39 or it's going to be the E46 M3. So initially I was like, I was going to get an E39 M5 because it was super fast. It was like the newest generation of the E34 and 5 I tried to build out of my, you know, shitty 525i from 1989. So actually, I met Ed this way. I test drove one at his dealership. And uh, the problem was I just got out of, I just graduated from college. I had my first job. And so I had income, but I had like not very much credit history. And they wanted me just to get a parental cosign. And my mother was like not having it. And I knew my dad would say, you're buying what? So I said, what am I going to do? So. Um, lo and behold, kind of out of nowhere, I find this E46 M3 in Colorado Springs, uh, and I apply, and although I got, like, literally in the mail uh, a notice that I did not get approved, 
they said, hey, you're approved, come out. And, um, and obviously I got that letter in the mail later, but it kind of explains what happened. I, I later find out that uh, uh, the way I got approved was that the, the salesman had gone to his credit union, told him that his cousin uh, was applying for a loan, and it, like, it uses good, they use his goodwill to approve him. And there's this, you know, this white guy with apparently his black cousin uh, getting a loan out at some small credit union, but it worked. And I had no ticket purchase. I got up, I went to um, AirTran the next day. That was still a thing. And um, because I was still 21, I could fly AirTran U. So I just walked up, said, hey, I'm trying to fly to Denver. And um, I got a ticket for like $69, hopped on the plane, um, got there, got a shuttle to Colorado Springs where the car was. Uh, and it was there. Um, and I was like, okay, I'm gonna do this. They got me approved. I was like, this is great. I'm getting my first car. As dumb as I was for buying the car, they asked, hey, do you wanna buy a warranty for like an extra 40 bucks a month? And I was like, whoa, I spend 40 bucks, a, $40 a, a week at the bar at least, right? Like I can buy a warranty. And I kid you not, by the time I sold that car, which was about um, three and a half years after I bought it, um, I had in the ballpark of $16,000 of receipt totals, of which I had only paid about $3,000. I had gone through so many different things, like, you know, the alternator one day, the, um, then I did, uh, what else did I do in that car? Uh, the Vanos repair was about $8,000. So the, all that's gets you to 10, then like this actuator on the top broke, that was another thing. Um, a lot of bushing work, just it added up quickly, but I bought like the bumper to bumper, just covered it all. But I, eventually I maxed out on the value of the warranty for based on what the car pays for. And sometimes it was also like the hours for like the Vanos. It's too many hours to bill, so I was on the hook for those. But yeah, it was basically, I, I totaled it out almost. Um, so I hop on the highway and I'm just driving through the night and it's country road and it's like, man, it's wide open. like. This is my first M car, it's pretty fast. I had kind of punched it, but I hadn't really tested the car out yet. And um, I guess within about maybe an hour and a half of just driving open road and it was about 2 a.m. I was like, it occurred to me that my friend, Matt, who had an E34 M5, had sent me a picture where he was on some highway and he was going at the limiter like 155. And I was like, okay, I wonder uh, with maybe a little downhill assistance if I could get a similar photo to kind of one up him, like even one mile an hour. So I wanted to be safe about it. So I said, okay, I'm just gonna take off and I won't look down at how fast I'm going. I'll just keep hitting my take a picture button on the iPhone. This is before you could hold it down for the like rapid fire shot. And uh, I'm, you know, flooring it. And I don't know what I saw. I'm convinced it might've been uh, maybe an in internal, like an interior light in the cop car. But I just saw something. It seemed like a little bit of light in the distance outside of the range of my headlights. And I just like hit the brakes. I just slamming, slamming, slamming. And I know later from the pictures that the last photo I got was like crossing 127. So I was probably somewhere north of 130 at the time. And uh, I'm coming, scooching to a halt. And um, I see the cop. I immediately just get over to the right lane. He pulls out, I pull over, put the lights on. And uh, I was like, man, I'm definitely going to jail. I've got to call my parents from jail in Kansas, which is going to be a complete shock to them. They're going to be furious and disappointed. Um, but uh, it's happening and I was relatively calm for all <laughs> intents and purposes for the circumstances. But um, ah, he came to the, my window, rolled it down and he expressed I assume you were going a lot faster, but by the time I got a read on you, you were going 40 miles an hour. And I was like, sigh of relief, like, whew. Uh, and he asked me a few questions because like he couldn't see my tag and whatnot. And uh, I got very lucky and he was like, he wrote me a citation for going too slow on the highway and for failure to have a temp tag that was visible because uh, it was behind my tenant window. And I just couldn't believe it. He was like, look, you know, it's a lot of road ahead to Atlanta, Georgia, where you're going. I slow it down because I'm gonna radio ahead. So I, um, I kept it right at the speed limit the whole way home, but it was a lot of fun. Um, so yeah, it's my first trip in my 
my new M3 and I kept the car for like three years, actually never got a ticket in it. I, w I learned my lesson. Um, at least that's what I'm gonna say on the record. <laughs>"How did you miss this and how did I miss this?" So I get in the market for a BMW 550i M Sport manual. I wanted an M5 but was scared away like a lot of people are by maintenance and heard an oil change was 5 bajillion dollars. So I th well clearly if I get a 550i a regular man's BMW maybe that's going to be less expensive on maintenance. So I find one in Florida. I'm not one to buy a car sight unseen, so I do the diligent thing, hire a firm to go look at the car, pre-purchase inspection. It looks pretty good, caught a few things, whatever things that they can catch, it'll at least help offset whatever money you're discussing. So I thought it was a pretty good thing to do. I remember having a specific discussion as well around the wheels and the tires. Wheels had some, uh, the clear coat was coming off a little bit, didn't look that bad in the pictures. And I had a specific conversation with the guy about the tires too, because as I had really become very educated in is that they wear quite a bit on the insides. They're very wide tires, even for the 550 eyes. Make a decision to go for this thing. All right, let's do this deal. And in the process, I had a Civic that I was going to sell to my cousin who lived around that same area. She lives in Clearwater, the car was in Tampa. So drive, wife, kid, we get in the car. I left at like two in the morning after work. This is, you know, great car stuff, real fun to do. Get down there, see the car in person, a little less than excited. It was way more rough than I'd anticipated, but at this point I kind of had painted myself in a corner because I needed a car to come back in. And I already agreed to sell my Civic to my cousin who needed a car and I didn't want to put her in an odd spot. So I just pretty much dealt with it and made the deal with the guy. It turns out he was a dealer the whole time. He was playing it off as if, as if he was an individual. I don't know, maybe that was an appeal to think that you're gonna get a better deal or that you don't have a dock fee. He hit me with a dock fee as, no, this is, this is where I draw the line. We're not doing a dock fee on this, this is ridiculous because you didn't even tell me you were a dealer. So we had a bit of a rocky start with this thing, right? So I get this car, I'm still pretty pumped because they're really cool cars. Whole story changes when, this is poor due diligence on my part, go to fill it up with gas. And I'm not sure why I didn't think to do it before, but at that point when I'm pumping in gas, I'm able to kind of walk around. I'm like, you know what? I'm just gonna kind of get on all four and look underneath the, the back end of the car. And I look at the rear tires and there's wire exposed. I'm livid at this point because a, it costs a lot to get these things replaced, and B, that's no way to drive a family home. I think at this point my kid was one, you know. So I called the guy up and said, look man, you know, we had a specific discussion around these tires. How did you miss this and how did I miss this? But this, this isn't gonna fly. I said, you're gonna need to replace these tires and I gotta have it done soon because I need to drive back to Georgia. I'm not doing that on tires that have wire exposed. I don't know when they're gonna pop. He's already just, you know, instant wall up. It's quite difficult. I, I at least kind of call around, find out where I can get some tires. I can't get them that day. None to be found in Tampa. Strange, but there wasn't. I was quite disappointed. And I tell the guy, look, man, this, this deal is either off or we're going to figure something else out entirely. And he's just putting the wall up. Says, no, you know, that's, that's not how it's going to go. And, uh, you know, you bought the car. Basically, it's, it's now your problem. I disagreed. And I started pushing against the guy and I said, look, man, provided you a cashier's check, but I can stop this check. Now, I know more about it now than I did before and maybe he didn't know, but apparently when you do put a stop check on it, it basically freezes the funds from you or him the whole time for, I wanna say 90 days or something crazy. So I didn't feel like having that happen to me, but at the same time, I wasn't gonna be buying this bad bill of goods. Very reluctantly, he said, fine, you know, bring me the car back. He was very disappointed. I was absolutely super upset because number one, it was very hard to find this car, right? Very hard to find one of those. So I managed through my cousin who was there, fortunately got a ride back. This was pretty much the entire day. It's 5 p.m. I'm back at her house. I got no car. I have no car because she has my car and the other guy has the car that should have been my car. Get a nap in about six o'clock. It's time to get going, figure out what we're gonna do. So I rent a car from an airport in Tampa. Fun fact for all of you watching YouTube, in the spring, right after spring break, 
in Florida, they have an influx of rental cars. They need to get out of that state. I didn't realize it, but that was the nice silver lining is that you can rent a car and it was $19 for a one-way out of, it's probably gotta be specifically for a one-way, but $19 for a one-way to Atlanta and a, it was like a fully loaded Camry. So we rented the car, got in the, got in the car at about seven or eight that night, kept driving, had some slight hallucinations and uh, arrived somewhere around three or four in the morning with no car. And thankfully I have some neighbors that are really cool. Let me drive their van to work a couple of days slash couple of weeks. It kind of worked out. I ended up buying a BMW M3, bought the car, it was a 2003 model for 9,800 bucks. It had less than 100,000 miles on it. It was really just very poorly maintained. Great car, but it was a very strange way to get into that when you think you're going the responsible route of a four door with a decent amount of power and all that fun stuff. But I ended up getting myself back into a coupe and I've, I've had this problem where I'm trying to be this responsible dad with four doors and because I have two daughters and a wife and all that good stuff, but I keep finding myself getting into an M3 coupe. And then after that, actually I was on the track for a couple of times with that. And it's probably due to my lack of poor driving, but I was getting passed by guys in Corvette Z06s and I figured if you can't beat them, join them. So I ended up buying a Z06 instead, took that on the track. And then I did end up passing a couple of guys with M3s. So totally worth it. The whole thing, whatever I went through, all for that moment, it was a good time. He is not allowed to drive any more cars, period. Are you gonna buy something or not? I went to the dealership with my mom who wanted to buy a convertible BMW. She had several convertible Saabs prior, a 9.3 and a 900 turbo. And uh, one was red, one was yellow and she loved them so much, but they had stopped making them. So she wanted a convertible car and she wanted a soft top. And I had said to her, you really don't want a soft top, especially in Minnesota. You want a hard top because over time, those soft tops tend to deteriorate and you get wind noise and you know leaks and that sort of thing. You know, If you're gonna keep this car for a long time, which my mom does, that you're gonna wanna have something that's gonna last a long time. So why not look at the new BMW 3 Series that has the foldable hard top, that convertible, the kind of you know thing that would go into the trunk. And she's like, no, 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 it's got to be a soft top. I said, mom, just just go look, have a you know whatever. So we go there and we get to this sales guy, and he's this short, stocky, very macho sales guy. And I'm not really saying much, and my mom is kind of talking to the guy, and I'm you know whatever not really paying much attention. And she's really adamant that there's a soft top and they, they're trying to explain to them that they stopped selling the soft top a number of years ago and it's only hard tops now. And she's very adamant she's gotta have this soft top and well, they can't find one. Well, sure enough, this is Minnesota in the winter. They have a BMW Z4 M series sitting on the showroom floor. And it's this special blue color, like this pale shimmery blue color. And it's the M series, and they were talking about how amazing this car is. They also had an F430 uh, that was sitting there, and I was, you know, kid in a candy store, like, wow, look at this thing, you know, cool. And I'm looking at it and kind of oogling and eyeing and not really saying that I, you know, I'm into cars or anything, but I'm just like, oh, this is, I'm admiring the, the artistry of the Ferrari and seeing how beautiful it is. And, and then look at the BMW, and I'm going, it's a very pretty car, and that's when the conversation starts. Oh, well, you know how powerful these things are. Uh-huh, okay. Dude, <laughs> my, my, my Camaro made 600 horse, my Viper made 550 to the wheels, my current Corvette makes 580 to the wheels. I've driven cars in excess of 1,000 horse. I'm sorry, this is not a fast car. <laughs> and that's kind of when car guy mode kicks in, you know, have, have some experience. I don't consider myself a great driver, but I consider myself competent and quick. I'm not fast, but I'm, I consider myself a quick driver. My SCCA autocross brain kind of kicks over and goes, what do you mean? How fast this thing is? It's not that fast. He goes, oh, you clearly haven't taken it for a test drive. I said, 
I'm not really interested, but but I you know I doubt it's that fast. And he goes, oh no no, it's got the you know the M power motor in it, inline six. Uh huh. Oh, neat. You know, good for you. And he goes, why don't you why don't you take it for a spin and, and uh, I'll show you what it's all about. I said, okay. He says, you can drive sticks. Said, sure. From the showroom, they open both the doors for me. We drive it out, and it's winter in Minnesota, and so there's slush and snow and ice. And we're driving it around, and we get up, I get up to temperature, and this really stocky, just, you know, I'm gonna tell you about cars sort of sales guy is there. And he's like, he's in the passenger seat. He's like, all right, you know, the car's warmed up. Why don't you, get, why don't you, see, you know, see what kind of power this thing gives you? Okay, it's all right. He's like, yeah, didn't you feel that? He's all right. You know, what, 300 horse, give or take? He's like, well, yeah, it's about that. I said, okay. He goes, oh, no, okay, well, he, he, clearly I'm not impressed by this. So he says, well, why don't you take a few corners? See how, see how corners. Okay. Again, former autocross experience. I'm going to go late break into uh, one, of the, one of these turns around a corner, give it kind of a quick little flick, try to get the back end to come, come around a little bit, and I'm noticing that the back end's not coming out around. And... I do this two or three time turns in a row and I'm noticing that it's not wanting to flick. And mind you, this is Minnesota. It's icy, there's snow on the ground and it's wet. Why is the car not wanting to jerk the back end around? I am trying everything I know how. I'm trying to, you know, give it the, you know, left right flick. I'm I'm giving it the throttle flick. I can't get it to do it. And I said I said, yeah, it might handle all right, but you know what I mean? It's just, it's just way too tight. You can't get the back end to go. And he, and, and he goes, ah, man, you're not just, you're, you know, you're not really driving it. And, and at this point, I'm not driving it as hard as I possibly could be. And he says, no, nah, no, nah, man, go, just, just, you know, go for it. All right, he's been egging me on for long enough. Forget it. I go into 10 tenths mode. I hit one turn where uh, it kind of came up to a T and I was going to make a right. I'm, I could see half a mile, no traffic. I said, perfect. I barrel into this as fast as I think I can humanly take this. Slam on the brake as hard as I can. Turn the wheel, still braking so that the back end will come out a bit, downshift, floor it, and that's when finally the ass end kicks out it was a beautiful power slide through the snow and the mush and the, the, the gook and the, all this stuff. And i am got my foot in it and I'm kind of coming around the turn and I straighten it out and I go, yeah, you're right, that was way better. And he goes, get out, we're done. Why? You, you, you told me to do that. He goes, no, no, we're done. You can't, we're, we're drive, 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 drive back to the dealership right now. Yes, sir, no problem put it into third gear, fourth gear, driving it real patient, real slow. He storms into the dealership. I park it outside, we didn't drive it back in because it's gotten mush all over it now. I got to take, go get it detailed. And he walks up to my mom and in full view of my mom and a bunch of other salespeople, he is not allowed to drive any more cars, period. Are you gonna buy something or not? And that's when my mom says, I don't think so. And he says, fine, you can't come back here. I don't ever want to see you back here again. And in my mind, I'm thinking, I wonder how long you're going to be a salesman here. Because probably not very long. <laughs> so my mom did not buy a BMW from him. She ended up buying a BMW from someone else who I did not test drive uh, their car either. Uh, but yes, I was, uh, I was banned from driving at that BMW dealership, at least from that one particular salesman. <laughs> We'd like to thank this month's VinWiki sponsor, Carly, and their connected car system. Their OBD device plugs into just about any car, 96 and newer, and gives you unprecedented access to exactly what's going on with your car. You get not only diagnostic codes to see exactly what's faulting, which tends to be a lot, 
in my case, but you can also do different coding to certain cars, particularly BMW and Volkswagen products. So visit the link in the description below and you can use the code VINWIKI for a discount. They'll tell you exactly what their device can do on your specific car, but at the very least, it works as the best OBD scanner that I've ever seen. I usually end up just buying the cheap ones at Advanced Auto Parts and then inevitably losing them. This one works with an app on your phone. It checks everything and I don't have to go Google the code. It tells you exactly what it is. And so I've liked playing around with it the last few weeks. I'm going to keep one with me on all my road trips coming up, but be sure to check them out and try one out for yourself.